Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, where we aim to tell it like it is, all biases laid bare. On today's edition, I'll be drawing attention to the importance of great national leaders, in case it wasn't obvious enough. Chuka is also flagging up on an apparently obvious need by saying it's time to reflect on the state of Nigeria and chat the way forward. Some might say, isn't that all we ever do here? And can I say no man is an island and is recommending men take a leaf out of women's book? We the men wait to learn from the women. Aisha Oyebode makes a debut appearance with her advocacy that brings to mind the image of a phoenix. She calls forth Africa to arise out of the ashes. It's the first time for everything. So welcome, Aisha. Liberos wraps up things by maintaining the momentum on critical discussions around the infectious disease bill. It captions it as a motion without movement. We're certainly set to move things forward, so I'll be setting the ball in motion after the break. Everything, even leadership, comes in styles and seasons. Leadership for these times, the importance of great national leaders. So given all that is going around in the world right now, COVID-19, the looming global economic and social crisis, insecurity, terrorism, climate change, and, and in, indeed technological changes that are all happening at the same time, there's no doubt that the world has entered a period of flux when it is not ending anytime soon, a period that indeed calls for steady, measured, and well-reasoned policies and actions to ensure that countries, especially one like Nigeria, plagued by decades of historical misrule, gets its act together to ensure our survival and hopefully our progress. This period, in my mind, calls for incredible, thoughtful, creative, imaginative leadership that is inclusive and inspiring. Nations rise and fall based on the caliber of leaders who rise to power. So look around you today. Do you believe we have such caliber of persons in position of authority today? Clearly, we have a huge leadership deficit. According to Lance Morrow, leaders make things possible. Exceptional leaders, on the other hand, make them inevitable. Our own Chinua Achebe in his book, The Trouble with Nigeria, says the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of leadership. There's nothing basically wrong with the Nigerian land or climate or water or air or anything else. The Nigerian problem is the unwillingness or inability of his leaders to rise to the responsibility, to the challenge of personal example, which are the hallmarks of true leadership. Indeed, for me, just like any building which is intended to stand the test of time, I guess this is where Chuka will tell us some more, creativity, careful planning, and diligent execution is vital in ensuring the delivery of a final project, which will be valued and admired for decades to come. The same is required in my mind to build a nation, especially one like ours, which was created out of many pre-colonial nation states. So indeed, leadership matters. The role of someone like Deng Xiaoping of China is one concrete example. His decision in the early 60s um, to change agricultural policies and commercial policies of, of that country changed. President Park of Republic of Korea, his decision to industrialize a country is another example of leaders playing an important catalyzing role in economic growth of their people. History is replete with stories and folklore around the role played by leaders in establishing nation states and moving their countries to great strides. Chucky's Kamal Atatok. The Kennedy in America, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, Winston Churchill, Queen Amina, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Thomas Sankara, and the list goes on and on. I mean, recently we can talk about Nelson Mandela's role in South Africa. People have often blamed citizens, on the other hand, saying that the failure of leaders is a result of the failure of citizens. Well, because it's the people that elect leaders. 
Well, for me, this is a fallacy. Who elected a coupist? Nature does not work that way in my mind. Just look at worker ants and bees, bee colonies, for example, of the role of leadership. Again, no one running for office ever said, vote for me so I can give you poor health care and take away your jobs, and I'll perhaps be so incompetent that millions of you will become poorer and live under rising insecurity. What we currently have is a set of leadership committed with a blood oath to the status quo of compromise and incompetence, more committed to protecting their image and status than actual focus and service. In Nigeria, we've been incredibly unlucky with leadership at all levels, whether civilian or military, perhaps due to how the country was formed. According to Professor George Obiozo, not one of the leaders we have had have been able to evolve a unifying national ideology that was embraced either by the fellow, fellow political elites or by the entire Nigerian populace. Yet these leaders keep talking about how Nigerian unity is not negotiable. It's quite ironic indeed. When Nigerian leaders past and present have been unable to deliver any kind of leadership that inspires unity. So for me, Nigeria's unity is definitely negotiable and must be renegotiated for it to stand or survive the test of time. Unity is not something that is coerced. It arises of a conscious willingness of a group or people to come together for their common interest. It is clear, at least now, that our diversity is in disarray. Insecurity grows. Our economy is in near shambles. We have become the poverty capital of the world with over 100 million people in horrible poverty. And our current democracy deficit lies dangerously close to bankruptcy. But let me end here and, and allow my, my colleagues to jump in. Let me end by quoting Professor Obiozo again. If we're to salvage our country, we must begin to face reality, stop the syndrome of self-deception and self-delusion about Nigeria's historical exceptionality. And I completely agree with him here. Thank you. I mean, you, you said a lot of things which I agree with. Um, I hope you're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> surprised today you agree with me. No, because you made sense yeah. to me anyway. Um, there, there, there is Maybe quite because a... Because you're not discussing Christianity. No, I'm sure he mentioned he'll go there eventually. But, um, he may, you know, the thing about leadership, it, it's, mm. significant, it's more significant than we appreciate. Yeah. Yes, and it's good you took on that because I've been one of those who say when you're trying to get people to rise up to their responsibility um, of holding the leaders accountable, you sort of say you get the leaders you deserve. And I know there's a context for that, but actually, to be honest, if you have good leaders, even those people will we'll be inspired rise enough yeah. to rise. So if when you start doing which came first, chicken or the egg, I'm inclined to think good leadership comes before, <laughs> before the, the followership. However, where I then come in is to say, and thank you for the people you listed, it's helpful to remember mm -hmm. that. Um, where I, I then say, okay, when you now have that leadership, even if they are good, if you don't have people who are informed enough to engage them and to keep them accountable and honest, even good leaders will turn bad. So we, this is where it becomes a partnership. Yep. At some point, we need to also recognize that building a nation and a strong democracy has to involve people engaging and interrogating the leaders that we have. And to that extent, I think we're beginning to do that more now with whatever leaders we have. And I can see that it is bearing fruit when we've done it. It's just that we don't have the, the right kind of leadership to begin with. And that's where I stop. I, I think Chuka is um, itching to... Chuka! <laughs> so I, I, was just, I was just listening to you. Um, yeah, chicken and egg, very good uh, analogy there by you. And yes, um, I think that we, some blame has to go to the people of Nigeria um, because these people, leaders and what, what, what we call leaders and so on, but we don't even have leaders anyway, really. We're just misusing the word. We have rulers. Um, um, so maybe first, if we don't misuse it, we might get ourselves in the right frame of mind to, to talk. Um, but they come from us. And I think there's some deep-seated problem that we really need to get down to with us, the country as a whole. Interesting point. It's becoming obvious now. Because we're just recycling the same thing. And they use, we, we feel like we're in a hopeless situation. And I know that that's because where we are drawing from, we already know what is there. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know that um, you get what I, I mean. It, is that Aisha, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm sorry, I'm here sorry. rather. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so I think um, there's the followership issue, but from my perspective, I think part of good leadership is being able to acknowledge when you really do not have the capacity to lead. And that applies to all of us. You know, so 
I mean, you look at the fact that what has been a challenge, you've had what we call, you know, leaders that when we were, or if we were still an industrial age country, you know, then they would be the right kind of leaders. But, you know, Nigeria has moved beyond that. Look at even our demographics. Look at the youth. Even our generation is beginning to get old in relation to them. And I think it's being able to say, you know what, I need to stand down because, you know, I really do not work, have what it takes. Yeah. You know, I think that's a very, very important acknowledgement of, you know, what it takes. I don't have the capacity. There's nothing wrong with saying that. And I think that's yeah. an important thing that we need to think about. But then, so that then brings me to the next question, which is the really hard one. How do we then fight to make sure that the leadership is now transferred to the generation that actually should be leading? I think that's a really, really difficult and challenging. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, we were basically looking at leadership from just one prison, political leadership. Um, if that's the leadership we're discussing here, then we really don't have political leaders, but rulers. Okay. Um, or we have, and then it's quite unfortunate when we say, oh, because they are drawn from amongst us. Uh, are they time. really drawn from amongst us? That's a big Once question. Once upon a time. That's a big question. And then if you look at, um, for you to understand our political leadership, you also need to first and foremost understand our cultural and traditional leadership. In African or Nigerian traditional leadership, the leader can do no wrong. They can't, they can do no wrong. And so, also, we also forget as at that time, for you to be a traditional leader, you must also evolve through a system where you will be taught and trained to do no wrong. And, um, and that's why if you, rem if you remember the old Oyo Empire, there were checks where a traditional ruler can be asked to go and commit suicide for doing wrongs. But, we imbibe that traditional role into our political leadership and still maintain that idea of the leader can do no wrong. And that's why you hear Ajimobi say, you are talking, do you know who you are talking to? I'm the constituted authority. But you forget that, we're forgotten that for you to assume that position, there is supposed to be a higher responsibility. There's supposed to be a training. There's supposed to be um, a, a leadership training program that you ought to go through to emerge as a leader, and not because one person just raised your hand and said, go and be. And so if you take, I, I, I did an advocacy on this long time ago, so if you take a look at all of the presidents that we have had, none of them, even this one that came, people went to beg him, come and be, mm -hmm. and, and for, to protect certain interests. And so, and then you look at the people that, you know, these people are confronted with at the polls. You look at all of them and you say, choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. And then you turn around to say they are drawn from amongst us. I, I have that, more to say, but because yeah. time is up. I, I Let think, me wait for the next, I, I next think time round. time is up, but, but uh, very impressive. I, I mean, I mean, it's the whole idea was just to, you know, push the button on this thing. Well, interestingly, what Emeka has been uh, discussing with us is uh, very similar to what I'm about to discuss as well. So after the break, we're going to carry on. So I'll be talking today about New Nigeria, New Africa. There's an urgent need to reflect on the state of Nigeria and a just as urgent need to map a way forward. I'm about to make obvious statements, but there is a need to say them again. The black man is under threat worldwide. In the meantime, he messes up his homeland and foolishly seeks a good life abroad. Who really enjoys having his home marauded by outsiders? A guest every now and then is fine but not a continuous occupation by guests. COVID-19 has laid bare Africa's unpreparedness as a continent to stand up to emergencies. The basics are missing. There never were schools, so a shutdown is of little consequence. Online schooling, pull the other one. Hospitals, jokes, all of them. Simple instructions to stay at home have now become the stuff of dictionary checks. Kano, Sokoto, and others permitted worship for Eid El Fitri. Perhaps it's a case of kill yourself if you want to, but please spare others. Christian organizations, churches, if you may, push to reopen. Personally, I shall be pleased for another year of shutdown for them. They need reorganization. The Nigerian church must be dragged screaming into the 21st century, and I suspect same for Islam. 
it is time once again to advocate a mindset change. I will continue to do this under a different guise each time. We need to change. Not that one of APC, but true change. Nigeria and Africa must rise again. Economic prosperity will come for us when we buckle down and embrace honesty, sincerity, and technology. And stay back at home to rebuild. To disturb Bob Marley a bit, chase those crazy idiots out of this town. You know who I'm talking about. Do we know, do we know who you're talking about? <laughs> Uh, no, there are a lot of people, not just one person. Okay. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not in the singular. I, yes. I think for me, it's, it's uh, and thank you, Chuka, for this advocacy, because I think it just it kind of flows into um, um, the, my own topic early on. Um, clearly, um, there is a need for us to, to imagine a new country. You know, it's, it's, it's to imagine it. We've been living with an imagination of the British for the last hundred years. This is how they imagine Nigeria. We as Nigerians, it is time for us to imagine a new country, you know, visually imagine it and walk towards it, you know, for either from the social political side and from the economic side. How do we build industries? How do we build clusters of knowledge here? We need to pursue that imagination, you know, and find the people, the right people, whether they're here in Nigeria or outside of Nigeria, who are Nigerians who share in, in, in our belief and be more open. You know, we, we've sort of, you know, um, will I say delegated or subjugated everything to the concept of in God, that God will do it for us, you know, some higher power. And countries that have made that jump to, to do well have done it not, not because God was absent, but because they chose deliberately to work for it. And we are not doing the work. In, the, in, the, in, in my view at this time. And I think that's what we need to do. Okay, um, I mean, I, and, and, and so the question of mindset and all of that, it's all part of it. But the, the type of leadership we, we must have now, the people who want to lead us, most people who have demonstrated capacity to, to create that kind of vision. Okay. And, and to take it from there, but also to go back to the, the, the mindset thing, um, what always jumps out at me when people are talking about mindset is that you need people to be educated or at least to be taught to think. You know, yesterday, uh, one of recently, we're looking at uh, Children's Day, and um, I was impressed with some of the, the ways the children expressed themselves. You could see that they were used to being challenged to solve problems, but you could also see the children who were not used to that and they were just regurgitating. Mm. So it doesn't come automatically. To engage your brain doesn't come automatically. You don't even have to be educated as per you know, in a classroom. You can just be taught to engage your brain to solve problems, um, and it shows. So. Uh, what I sort of thought about when, I, when you were talking was uh, I was thinking about my dad's generation. And one of the things that pleased me most about that generation is that they had scholarships. My dad, you know, the background wasn't well to do. But for the scholarship, and he was able to get into a school that didn't just give him an education because he was telling me about it and we're chronicling it together. It gave him an environment where he could imagine. He played things like cricket. He did drama shows. So his whole world, okay. he could compete with people from any walk of life. This so he, he was able to transpose himself from a background of a poor man to the background where he could compete this with anybody on any scale. This is new Nigeria is challenged. That's what I'm saying. So, I, I, and he was, so it was, there was, challenged. there was a challenged. This is a full stop. I'm coming now, but there was a capacity for him to then be upwardly mobile. One of the frustrations I have with Nigeria is that the only way you're going to upwardly mobile yourself or, or mobilize yourself out of poverty is either you're a thug or a politician. Not Nigeria, some may say not, the two don't the use the word Nigeria as the rulership. Well, I don't rulership. know. Like, the system is now making oh, it such that well, like you're not an entertainer. Have, that makes up Wait, the now, let me, let, me, let me express myself so that even I'm clear what I'm saying. If the system is rigged against being able to imagine yourself out of poverty, except you start trying to think of thuggery or political, um, you know, thuggery, another form of it, or celebrity status. So we need to make, create an environment that rewards merit-based, you know, investing in people who can then invest in themselves. As, as it is now, I can't really see hope for a young person who is not well-to-do coming back out. Back to the point. Yeah. The point is, yes, a new Nigeria is possible, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I don't see it. Do you know why? Because those things, there are foundation. You just talked about the foundation. Education. Those things that will enable a new Nigeria is not there at all. Chuka talks about churches, mosques, all the same thing. Everybody's bidding its time to get the cookie jar. And so, no leadership anywhere. 
we all have rulership. And so with all of that, nobody's laying the right foundation. Recently in the UK, you saw them, you know, um, co-opt about two, 200 youths into um, Labour Party to build the next generation leadership. And they start from there. So the next generation, the, when you start hearing names, they didn't just spring up to say, oh, I have been told, I've just been identified because I talk so much on TV. I've just been identified to come and be. They have taught that person through a process. But here, what are we doing? We are not teaching anybody. As public schools, you can't call schools. Chuka talked about it. The churches are not teaching anybody anything. Our mosques are not teaching anybody anything. And so, what do you have? What role model are we building? Nothing. Apart from Malologede, Malologede, Chobanana, uh, Yugoyo. Uh, so, that's what you <laughs> see now. That's what even, that's what attracts. No leadership, no role model. And the likes of um, Laji Latif, Jakonde, uh, Bisio, Nobanjo, and all of those people, they had role models. They had leaders that they could model after. And after that, Nothing, everything stopped. All people wanted was join military, become a, a military administrator. And then when that stopped, now join Togri and become a politician. a politician. We must now begin to challenge anybody that comes, wants to contest for political office. What plans do you have for health, education, education um, industrialization, and all of that? And if we look through them and find that it doesn't suit what a modern society needs, you jettison that person. I think that one unique opportunity that common education gives us that we've not utilized is the capacity to be able to create a certain way of thinking. You know, and some, you know, if you look at it, if you look at even countries, and I'm looking at Western countries, I'm also looking at even Asia, but if you look at countries like the United States, for example, once you go through the education system, you come out with a general mindset about basic understanding of certain values, certain issues. If you look at countries like China, China, it's the same thing. Some people may say it's brainwashing, but that's not what it is. It's that if we use our system of formal education well, we'll have a common... One of the things that you find that is very unusual about us here is that people don't even have a general basic um, common view about a lot of things. And that's because our formal system of education is failing. And if you look back to our parents' generation and the generation before this, I think that was what was different about um, the system of education. So I think it's one of the things that we really need to look into. Yeah. And very quickly, so if we start today, a child that is five years old, in another 15 years that have actually finished university, so it's just, it's not going to take that long to change a whole generation. We just need to decide that that's what we want to do. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Chuka speaks the, of a mindset change, and so do I. After the break, stick around. Failing to ask can sometimes mean that you're asking to fail. Time to ditch the macho mindset, don't you think? I'm going to be talking about no man is an island. Money can't buy love, and yet it's generally accepted that the lack of it can destroy love. A man's life is not defined by how much money he has, and yet the lack of it can send him down a path of ignominy. With the looming global recession and even depression, it's no wonder I find myself reflecting on money more and more these days. What cuts should I prepare to make? Was that expenditure frivolous or frugal? Has enough been done to support those facing a tougher situation than myself? There are findings that show that the Great Recession, which began in 2007, could be linked to more than 10,000 suicides across North America and Europe. The study by the British Journal of Psychiatry showed that between 2008 and 2010, suicide rates soared in these parts of the world, with a four times higher increase in the suicides amongst men than women. It would be ostrich-like of us not to anticipate that the economic pressures brought about by COVID-19 will not induce similar or greater pressures than that induced by the Great Recession. So, what are we to do apart from bracing ourselves for the inevitable? It's instructive that although the male and female populations were in the Great Recession together, the statistics show that there was something in their gender disposition and or outlook that made the difference, four times the difference actually. To this end, might I suggest that it is at least not automatic 
that when the economy goes up, or rather goes down, suicide rates have to go up. We can position ourselves to ride the storm. As we mark Mental Health Awareness Week, it's time we realize that no man is an island. Men in particular must learn to adopt a more help-seeking approach to life, especially in times of challenges. We must relearn what true strength is. It's not weakness to ask for help. On the contrary, this may be the advantage women have over men. Now is the time to locate what is of value and to be prepared to let go of the excess weight. Call it a wartime mindset. This will ensure we put life first and last and not the transient things in between. Yeah, uh, Kenny, well, I agree with you, but also, we also need to understand that uh, the way we learn and teach these days also, um, you know, says a lot about this suicide rate. You find out that um, people are not also, you know, taught about disadvantages or failure. So that's why I was telling somebody, you know, sometimes past that um, if you are, if you make first class or through life and then you graduate, you're very successful and the, the tendency for such person to commit suicide when failure comes knocking or when challenges comes knocking is very high, higher than that other person who stumbled and fumbled and then eventually, you know, got it right. You know, your children, these days there are no more fail. You know, it is, uh, he's, he's challenged, he needs to do well. And so that child also growing up, actually he never really knew what challenges is. Uh, challenges are, and so that's why you find that in some cases also, we say street sense, street sensibility. You need to understand it and also learn to strive a balance. And people that actually grew up, go check the suicide rates also and the figures and the, the way most of these people grew up. You find out that they never had been able to, they've never encountered challenges. Some of them, they, you know, dad is always there, mom is always there, I love you and I love you. I have a friend, sorry, I'm just rounding up, who is a, a, a clinical psychologist in America. And then he said that some of the things that they come to complain to her about, and he's like, go to Nigeria. These are normal daily occurrence. And then the person is crying that, oh, the world no longer loves me. Nobody has told me I love you in the past two weeks. And so I, I want to commit suicide. You know, so I, I think they also need to begin to borrow, you know, from some of us. Or uh, from this <laughs> part of the world. Are you not you being know, macho again? No, no, it's not about being macho. Uh, fall apart, uh, no, it's not about being macho. Yeah. That's, that's because fiction. Because you now make it look like suicide is no, not no, part of us. No, what yeah. I'm saying is that's mm. fiction. But okay. you find out that go check the record of some of these people. Yeah. Challenges. Yeah. They are not, they've I, never. I think, I think I'll speak to it. Um, and uh, Thank you, Kenneth, for this wonderful advocacy. Because, I, I, you know, we, we live in a society where men seem to think that, um, you know, um, it is my role to provide, to provide protect. And to protect. And therefore, if I'm unable to do that, that means I have uh, failed. failed. You know, but um, the you and know, some uh, women also yeah. believe, oh, if you are, and they push their men. Not a man. Yes, yeah. Um, so we need to. Men need to be. You know, when a man is on the soft side, people say, "Ah, oh, you're behaving like a woman." Yeah. Um, so society and upbringing has taught, uh, taught men to be more. Um, reclusive to hide their emotions and not to be open about certain things. And I think we need to understand that, um, as someone said, you know, speaking from the time of from point of business failure and failure generally, that um, failure is like the greatest um, lesson teacher ever. Um, yeah. And then we should we should understand that. Um, I had a boss once where I made a biggest mistake in my career one time, and uh, he started his presentation. It was a it was a like a board meeting, a group meeting. I started by putting a Mecca, my picture on the, on the big wall, and the mistake that I made, and, and everybody was like laughing at me. Then the next slide, he said, but this is why I love a Mecca. A Mecca is not afraid of mistakes. And he, and he, he, you know, he said this thing, make a brand new mistake every day. Oh, wow. Don't repeat the That's ones you made. And, and then every, everybody in the hall turned and everyone was looking at me again. I became the hero. So <laughs> for, for, from being the, from yes. zero to hero almost yes. instantly. Yeah, and I think people, you know, it's one of the things you were saying that people need to be socialized into learning how to ask for help. People don't know how to do that. Men especially don't know how to do that. And it's just as challenging for women. You know, there's a sort of a stigma attached around 
you know, uh, when mental health, which is beginning to lift. But I think that until more and more people are taught you can ask for help, it's not a sign yeah. of weakness. Um, people are just, you know, um, going to continue to, 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 to hide their feelings. Um, you know, going back to, I remember uh, when we were uh, much younger, someone said, she said to her mother, one day, oh, you know, honestly, I think I need to go and see a psychologist. And all her mother kept saying, God forbid, God forbid, because that's the way we see it. It's seen as a sign of um, weakness. So I, I absolutely agree. I think it's important for people to learn, to be socialized, to learn, to be able to ask um, for help. Yeah. I mean, Chuka, do you think now that we're looking at an economic recession, uh, do you think men are going to be under more pressure now? Um, there are less men under pressure now because, in any case, the mindset is changing. Um, but um, I don't know. I, 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 I somehow think that uh, it, it's, it's really funny, but I told somebody the other day that maybe all this new wave, you know, two children instead of five uh, makes children more emotionally dependent <laughs> on, on, on very clear signs of love and uh, whatever. I mean, when we're five in a family, we just um, had to, you Talk know, get things going, actually. I mean, you learn to be yeah. tough. Um, I believe that there's such a thing as emotional toughness. And I don't know how it works, but I know that that's how I live my life. I'm not sure why, but okay. it, it's something I've just always felt that it has to be like that. And I still feel so. Oh, yeah, but I have to, it would be good to look into how, how you came to be like huh? that. But we're out of time on this segment. Well, speaking of putting first things first, this is where we set our priorities right by making room to hear your feedback on our advocacies. On a new order, JJ says, this is what we have become experts at doing. All talk and complain and no action. While still in a spiral, that country is a failed project. He goes on to say, I'm tired of listening. Aren't you tired of talking? 60 years of systematic regression. Believe it or not, JJ, talking, listening, and action go hand in hand. Action without talk can soon become mindless action, don't you think? Do keep listening and sharing your mind with us. On the same topic, others have this to say. Odinaka Chuku Onyebuchi says, I enjoyed every moment of this program. Connection or corruption? I remember Libra saying that. How do we stop them? Because the whole thing seems one-sided. Also, Simeon B says, great show, good job. I pray the electorates get sense and stop voting incompetent and inept politicians into power. Thank you, Odinaka. Thank you, Simeon. We must be relentless in our national dialogue for change. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Aisha, our freshest panelist, sets us on, a, on the right path with her inspirational advocacy on envisioning not just a new Nigeria, but a new Africa. Welcome on board, Aisha. Thank you, Ekene. Might this not be a good time to dust off those clever sayings like every cloud has a silver lining? So um, out of the ashes of Corona, Africa must rise. So it's envisioning a new Nigeria through Africa. So interestingly, every time I open my WhatsApp during lockdown, I would be diverted to a newspaper article. I downloaded a couple of weeks earlier in which President Trump in February this year had listed Nigeria as one of the countries whose citizens would be barred from applying for immigrant visas to the United States in the future, citing security concerns. I remember there was quite a hula baloo about it at the time, and many were upset, almost like it was the end of the world. I also recall that last year, about this time, the UAE denying young Nigerian visas, a sanction imposed on all Nigerians because of the criminal behavior of a few. All the time, African countries were referred to as shithole countries by President Trump. You know, our reference to the foreign and our dependence on the munificence of external countries caused us to remain dumbstruck even when our sovereignty and our dignity was challenged. But here we are today, like all other African countries, we shut our airports 
on the 21st of March, 2020, we haven't gone anywhere. Nobody has come into Nigeria and the country is still standing. So what does that tell us? What does it tell us about what is possible, what we are capable of, and about our strength across the African continent? What does it tell us about our capacity to be independent? What does it tell us about our capacity to be able to stand on our own? What does it tell us about what we really need and what we have? What does it tell us about the unnecessary imports of huge amounts of consumables from China and the rest of the world, which includes toothpicks, by the way, that we haven't been able to do for a while. But at this time, we're only able to import necessary emergency supplies and we're still standing. We have become a country that produced nothing. We are so import dependent and external travel reliant that many probably thought we couldn't survive the closure of our borders. We need to start to review our priorities. We are a nation on a continent that is blessed with natural resources. We are blessed with rich soil for agriculture, a rich culture, a rich history, and a young population. If Africa could get its act together, we probably would produce most of the food that we consume. And after feeding ourselves, we could even feed the rest of the world. Take our doctors performing health miracles everywhere in the world except here. Take our cool bonnie life, treasured everywhere else except here. Every time all prices go up, we panic. Our external dependence leaves us afraid and is in a state of despair. Because we produce little, we sell our oil just so that we can squander the revenue on imports, foreign travel, and foreign goods and services, including education and health. Have we thought about what we can use our oil for internally? A lot. And please bear with me while I list it. Um, gasoline or petrol, foil oil, liquefied petroleum gas, you know, um, lubricant oil, tar and pitch, shale and heavy oil, gas hydrate. We could completely power ourselves. Then we have byproducts of oil. There are over 6,000 byproducts of oil. So, and the ones that come readily to mind are fertilizer. Um, linoleum, perfume, insecticide, petroleum jelly, soap, vitamin capsules, acrylic, nylon, spandex, roofing materials, water pipes, shampoo, antifreeze, combs, food preservatives, plastic, wood, rubber, cement, candles, hand lotion, balloons, crayons, ballpoint pens, ink, rubbing alcohol, epoxy, insect repellent, fertilizer, trash bags, aspirin, sunglasses, and even artificial limbs. So why can't we be self-sufficient? The grace of the Almighty is shining on our continent so far, but despite the odds, we're doing a great job managing the COVID-19 pandemic. So let us seize the moment. Out of the ashes of the coronavirus, let Africa rise. You know, I, I wish we were, I mean, I love this advocacy because, I mean, I, I'm glad we have like a theme this week. Mm. Um, new Nigeria. Yeah, New Nigeria. New it works, Africa. It works in New Africa. It works quite well. But, I, you know, I mean, uh, again, um, I don't want to sound, I'm a very optimistic person. Um, so there's a bit of a dichotomy when I'm going to say, optimistic. yeah, it, it's crazy. And I'm an Arsenal supporter as well. Okay. <laughs> no, Arsenal supporters are issues. always very optimistic. <laughs> but, they create excuses they why they can't choice. win. <laughs> But, but, but let me say this. Um, I, I speak on th three points I want to touch on. Uh, but before then, just quickly, um, I don't see any sign that we even understand or that we're ready to do the, the, the tough to lifting. To rise out of the To ashes. rise. You know, I mean, I don't see the sign yeah. presently. Yeah, I, I don't see I it. said before. Um, mm. It's not evident to me. Maybe I need some more education. I don't see it. Mm. Um, I, and I can, I can tell you why I don't see it just looking at what we're doing you now with COVID. Know. Everybody knows. Um, and then the other point is this. Um, even as we speak, I, I was talking about we have not been important. Trade has no, been no, going no. on. Seriously, we have been important. So China, know? China, China, every <laughs> oh, day. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, containers are we're, coming we're, in. Things have been coming in. I, 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 yeah. I noted it. I noted it. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> things have been coming in. Um, and the other point I also need to emphasize, though, is on the contrary, people tend to think that we don't need more trade. We actually need more yes. trade. People tend to say, oh, we're not in... No, no, no. We need more trade. What we, what, we, what, what we need less of 
is we need more trade internally within Nigeria. We need more trade within Africa to, to happen because we, we, all our material yes. seems to come from. So rather, I rather we, instead of taking two, two toothpicks from China, let's take it from, from Ghana or from Kenya. Benin Republic mm. or, from or from Kenya Tanzania. or from Tanzania and give them wood or something. Yes. Let's do the more trade internally. And, and the other thing, too, because we also seem, seem to think of agriculture, agriculture. Any country that has millions of people in agriculture, the way we do, is actually not a good thing. We need less people in agriculture, but more food. So we yeah. seem to think that, oh, the, the more people in agriculture, the more go and, every graduate go and farm. It's actually we don't a have, sign. We don't have, it, it, it's, who, it's who not, don't have infrastructure you know, look, to process yeah. the agriculture. Okay. So we, we, need, we need to have that, that's why we'll bring less more people in agriculture, agri but more mechanized agriculture, okay. Um, okay. but more food. Mm. Because the number, the millions of people we have farming now are not even producing enough for us. Yeah. So because we have <laughs> things of land use, you have uh, land use uh, reform that we're not all, doing. Apart from all of um, these uh, wastages. If exactly. you go to go to Boko, go to go to go to, uh, um, go to my twelve, my twelve. You see, no, Boko waste, is far. Wastages. Boko is far. So go I to think my 12. I think I think clearly for me is again question of leadership. We need the people who understand that the, the, there's a momentum, which, yeah. is, which I agree, Aisha has a point. We, we, the, there's a momentum that we can we need ride to seize, on. Yes. We need to seize it. But I don't think the present crop of, at least in this climate, I'm not hearing, the, I'm not hearing even health. Yeah. Mm. I tweeted something about health, that people were, were addressing COVID simply f from providing, treating COVID. We're not treat, there's no, I've not heard of any new policy, health policy. How do we build more hospitals? Too. How do we, <laughs> so we're just treat, oh, let's, let's do chloroquine, let's do hydroxychloroquine, let's treat it, but that, that's not These are health. the numbers of deaths today. You're These dealing are the numbers with, we still, of have, we still have Lassa fever killing thousands of people. We still have malaria killing, killing mothers and still have infant, high infant mortality. Oh, yeah. So that's not the discussion. We're just treating one thing but there's, there's, there's a thousand other things that are ready to you, kill us. You see, America, you see, um, um, this um, Aisha's advocacy, if I were the president of Nigeria, I will summon an emergency meeting, lead this word for word, I would table it before my team and say, look, this is it. Work on this. We need to use this to drive a new process. Yeah, everything they need is here. All they just need is, okay, how do we make mm -hmm. this possible and work around it? You know, you drive your team with this. We can actually seize the moment. Look at all the areas that she has touched, all the issues that she has raised, and where we are. So we take it from here. But unfortunately, the kind of rulers that we have, the first question will be, what is in it for me? How do I make something from this? And that's why you are not seeing any feasible infrastructure or plans to move us out of the level we are in. And that's why I am a local government of my own. I provide almost everything for myself. And that's why at the end of the day, COVID or no COVID, we'll still wake up tomorrow and be heavily dependent on China. And in fact, as we speak now, government is, the president has sent um, another request to the House of Rep for loan. And, and nobody's looking inward. Where can we, you know, tap into to ensure that, you know, we get more money from? Nobody's looking at that. We're talking about agriculture. Go to my 12. Every day we're wasting tomatoes. We're wasting um, mm -hmm. yams. Nobody's, you know, government does not have any concrete plan, apart from individual plans, to ensure that this, there's a process to ensure that these tomatoes are turned to paste so that you don't waste, you know, so much tomatoes like you're wasting them. Nobody's... We had a minister from, of agriculture who's from Benue State and he prided himself as well, one of the big farmers. And he has a farm he has never really been to. Mm -hmm. And then he does not, he didn't encourage one factory processing, um, whatever you call it, um, uh, juice making factory to his state. So and, Chuka, and, uh, uh, is, I think you need to come in at this quite point. Unfortunate. I think to, yes, I think, to, I think to round up, what it is, I, I, I talked about us having... Um, uh, uh, you know, generally just having honesty, sincerity, and technology. That's the reason why I put technology there, because it would seem like an odd thing to have put when you're talking about honesty and sincerity. But without technology, I mean, we've discussed on this forum before how our rice production is pathetically low per hectare, and yet the president boasts that we are first or second largest rice producer. So it's not about how much you produce, but how well you produce it. And if you can't run your agriculture with technology and therefore properly, which is where Emeka says it's not more people we need, it's actually less, but more food, so that we can go and get 
into other things, like um, what Aisha has shown us, how the oil industry is just completely underdeveloped and underfought. Um, so basically, we need to become a technologically based country. And once we adopt that, many things will fall into place. It's like reimagining. We're saying we need to imagine a new Nigeria. So when you say, when, when someone listens to your advocacy, what they see is that the capacity is there in case they forgot. Yeah, that there's absolutely. nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with our country. There's nothing wrong with our people. We can do this. And, you know, I know people yeah. feel that they're frustrated with hearing us talk and complain. But actually, that talking for me continues to build a mindset that yes, we don't have to be in this situation. And eventually, they'll come to a critical point where I know Emeka is saying he can't see anything. But I, I see some stirrings underneath because each time you have this conversation, people keep asking the same question. Why are we not moving well, forward? Your glasses. Oh, like you maybe see. I need to borrow your glasses to <laughs> see so what you can see. see. <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying to say that there is because I get stirred up. And eventually, all these things, time and opportunity will come when you will now seize the, you know, who knows? One of us might be in a position to make that difference. So it's good that we keep saying it, we keep having these conversations. So we we'll be pushing. reminded. Yeah, so who knows? Libros or, or I or Emeka may be in a position to, to actually move things to the next stage. So, and who knows who is watching that may be in a position to make that crucial decision and move us out of this uh, state of inertia or even backward motion. So I want to thank you for that. I, you know, I think you've helped continue to create that vision of a phoenix, Africa rising out of the ashes. A fresh voice often makes for a more distinct note. After the break, I'll be taking a fresh look at familiar topic. Only an irresponsible government abdicates the responsibility to our people and enact laws to further fleece the same people. Infectious Disease Control Bill, MWM, Motion Without Movement. The Speaker of Nigerian Lower Parliament, known as the House of Representatives, recently introduced the bill on the floor of the House known as the Infectious Disease Bill. The essence of the bill, if passed, is to replace the old Quarantine Act of 2004 and give government a legal backing for the control of infectious diseases. And typical of our most politicians, he had to travel far to Singapore to copy word for word an Infectious Disease Act enacted by them in 1977 during the authoritarian single-party dictatorship rule of Lee Kuan Yew, and to further expose the lack of adaptation and insensibility of the sponsor, the only difference between the Singaporean version and ours in the name of the country and the director general. Anywhere there's Singapore, a speaker simply changed into Nigeria, and where you have director, he simply added the word general. You know, we love military titles. The provision of the bill, which seems to remind one of the hate speech and social media bill, sponsored by the same house sometimes last year, aims to create a new set of rules which are not only in conflict with the provisions of the constitution, but gives the director general of the Center for Disease Control, the powers of a policeman, a judge, and an executor. As it empowers the center to arrest without warrant, declare any house an isolation center, and no liability shall lie against the DG or members of his team for any act or mission. That's section 71 of the bill. Section 58, in clear violations of the provisions of the constitution, empowers the DG or any member of his team to arrest without warrant any person he has reason to believe has infectious disease. So if the bill is passed, all of us have to carry a certificate of non-compliance. So otherwise, you can be arrested without warrant as someone with infectious disease. Section 55 of the bills require any person to provide any book, document, or correspondence requested by the DG and allow him to unrestricted and unfettered power to enter and search any premises without warrant. That means any journalist, anybody can be arrested if in the opinion of the DG, he has materials that might embarrass the center. How bad can this be? Now wait for this. Section 24 empowers a police officer to arrest without warrant and take to a place target isolation center by the NCDC, anyone who is suffering from any infectious disease. That means if you have flu, cough, or even yawn close to any healer, whale, or hater, which is an infectious disease, you can be isolated, depending, of course, on the person exercising the discretion. Section 20 empowers the DG to prevent any meeting at all, including this one. If in his opinion, that meeting will increase the spread of an infectious disease. I wonder how he can, on face value, determine who has infectious disease, since it is in his opinion. With such laws, the Director General, which appears 134 times while the word disease appeared in the Act 124 times, according to a journalist, David Hundei, might even be more powerful than our President. Section 17, 17 also empowers the DG to evict residents on the basis of overcrowding, yet government does not have houses to provide to anybody. The what part of the bill is section 15, 
which contrary to the provisions of the Constitution on ownership of movable and immovable property, empowers the minister for the purpose of preventing the spread of infectious disease to declare any premises an isolation center, including yours and mine. And any person who lives or is suspected to have left an isolation center can be arrested without warrant. In fact, the word arrest without warrant appears 14 times in the bill. With such powers, police officers no longer need to have recourse to the police act, as all they need to do to is just use the disease, uh, infectious disease control act and arrest you without warrant. Boom. It is sad and unfortunate that a country where about 53% of the population do not have access to good drinking water, and more than 40% of the population still openly defecate in water because of lack of toilets. One would have expected that any infectious disease control law would first and foremost task government to provide these basic needs to their people, instead of looking for opportunities to declare people's personal properties as a solution center and arresting people without warrant, all in the name of controlling infectious disease. I would therefore advocate that this, the obnoxious sections in this infectious disease bill should not only be expunged, but it should be included in the bill that government should, as a matter of urgency, first and foremost, provide the needed basic and affordable education, housing, clean environment, pot portable drinking water, and social infrastructure for majority of the people. With such infrastructure, government would have reduced disease, both infectious and non-infectious disease, drastically by at least 75%. And any law subsequently enacted to control infectious disease will not only be easy to implement, but would have the needed infrastructure, infrastructural backup to drive the process, rather than this copy and paste 1977 dictatorship piece of paper. I beg to leave. Can I, can I say that, um, you know, because um, thank you for this. David Hundain, who he wrote this very powerful uh, story, um, and I'm glad you brought him on the show um, a few weeks back. Um, it appears to me reading one from, you know, listening to you again, because I read it on paper, but to hear this very powerful evocation, the way you delivered it, it just, it sounds to me as if government is actually more of a threat to our health and safety than even the diseases, the so-called diseases that they want to fight. Because it sounds to me that you just, you want to take away liberty, property rights, um, without doing the essential function of government, which is health, safety and security. That's what you should provide for. You talked about people not having access to water, mass poverty. We are now in the poverty capital of the world. Infrastructure is horrible. Do that first. Be like Singapore in terms of infrastructure. And then we can even say, okay, fine, at least we, you know, um, in Singapore, every person has a home by government. Everybody has a home. It's, it's not, uh, there's no Singaporean citizen who doesn't have a house provided by government. So, you, 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 you know, I mean, and it has obviously toilet water and all of those things. So in, in a sense, I'm not excusing them, but in a sense, they, they, they can now even have the opportunity to carry out this kind of, uh, yeah. uh, uh, authoritarian. of, of, of authoritarian laws. Yes, um, honestly, I, I love, I mean, this advocacy is great. And I was just laughing through it because I think it's so embarrassing that we have to go out there and copy a 30-something-year-old act word for word and without even attempting to, you know, um, you know, change it a little bit, change it up so that we can modernize it. And as has been said, you know, we always like to place on our people a huge burden, but we never give them the same rights as the other people. So, you know, in Singapore, like you say rightly, the rights that the people have you know, may even give the government the um, ability to place, place on them that kind of burden. But how, how, how do we do that here? The second thing is that, you know, apart from this lack of privacy, you know, abuse of our human rights, then the issue of stigmatizing these infectious diseases. That's why we're going to see in places like um, Kano, for example, where there will be a huge um, surge and people won't talk about it because, you know, if, you have the right to arrest people and you know you are placing a burden of shame on the population so even when people have these um, diseases they're not going to come out and tell you they have it because it's like you're going to punish them for having it so it's um it's really um it's shining a light on us that it, it's not positive at all i want to just say it speaks to motive fundamentally to me because you know if someone can put this thing together and nowhere in his mind does he think oh 
you know, I, I have some responsibility to make this thing even look like I'm providing some kind of care. I don't, he doesn't seem to be, I don't know, is it that lack of intelligence or, and then so you say, okay, maybe the man himself is trying to be devious, but then who are those around him? They too are acting like they can't interrogate this the king's thing. mentality. They're waiting the king for Libras or they're waiting for David the King. Day. Yeah, so I'm just thinking we can't even masquerade because even the king, like you mentioned, you know, you have some authoritarian fathers and stuff, but at least they care enough to provide for their children. This one is not even, he's not even masquerading, he's not even trying to pretend, he's just openly trying to frisk us. And so I'm, I'm still looking for how we can checkmate some of these, because we're dealing with the executive yet, they have their issues, but now you have the, the legislatures. How a legislature... Which is supposed to check on the executive. How can we... How can we now even acting these, worse yeah, than, some of these acting frivolous worse than the executive. Yeah, have some of these frivolous bills, Crazy. because that's where it starts. How can we, we get, jettison them or even put some kind of, uh, I don't know, charge, they must suffer some kind of, how can you come up with some of these bills? They're, they're an insult to us as a people. So I don't know how we can do it, but it's not enough to say we refuse it. We need to make sure we penalize those who raise such bills. I just don't know where to start to do that. Maybe Libros has an answer, but Chuka. I think I'm surprised that um, it's only because we're in Nigeria. Um, Baja Biamila would have lost, would have had to step down. Yeah after this scandal, because it's a scandal, and we're just talking as if it's um, something, you know, like a naughty thing that happened. Uh, it's a scandal, big one. If um, Cummins is a scandal in England, then this is an even more massive scandal in, the, in, in Abuja. But lawyers need to get up and do more. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure that, that's the way I feel. Yes. Because we can only yeah. fight these things legally anyway. Yeah, thank you, Chuka, for that... Um... And then, um, mm. well, like Emeka said, we aim to tell it like it is, no matter who's us, is God. I added the second part, though. Do keep your comment coming in on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broad broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next time, when we'll be doing what we do best in partnership with you, let's keep advocating for a better society. See you. Bye-bye. Let me do like a new Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank Lovely you. seeing you. Bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, 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 I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.